The call on the ice stands. We got to go. Okay, fellas, we are set to go. Let's roll, boys. Come on, let's get going. We are kicking. Here we go. Both guys, five minutes each for fighting. Watch the blue. Play the puck. We're not doing it. After further review, it's the Scouting the Refs podcast. Yeah, baby. Here's your hosts, Todd Lewis and Josh Smith. Okay, gentlemen, play ball. Let's go. All right, guys, let's drop the puck. Josh, the season is finally underway, and I must say, let's let's thank those in the National Hockey League for providing us with so much material so early in the season. Man, it didn't take a lot of games for player safety to get involved, uh, penalty calls to be overturned, goals to be called back, coaches' challenges. It's been a jam-packed week. It's been one, and it hasn't even been a full week yet. So I, I don't know if we're going to have some record number of offenses to to deal with this year, but I'm I'm looking forward to it, and I'm really happy that hockey's back. This is the Scouting the Rest podcast, by the way. Please make sure you're following us on the social channels on Twitter or X. It's at Scouting the Refs to get Josh. For me, it's at Todd Lewis Sports on Twitter, X, and Instagram as well for for Josh. Okay, on this week's episode, no bucket, Sutherland mic'd up. A suspension, a big fine, not all players treated the same, and a special guest visit from Kevin Hastings. It'll be nice to talk to Kevin in a couple of minutes, won't it? Yeah, pretty cool. He just wrapped up a 20 plus career a 20 plus year career in the OHL and 20 years in the AHL. So nice to catch up with him as he, uh, I don't want to say rides off into the sunset, but maybe rides upstairs uh, into the sunset. There you go. On opening night of this NHL season, I mean, we could have almost done the first uh, the, the first show on on opening night because we had a player go without a helmet during the warm up, which is illegal. We had a goal review, we had a penalty shot, we had a match penalty. I don't know. Is this an indication of where the year is going? Do you think, or is it maybe just opening night? Everybody's focused on a lot of stuff. I think guys are fired up. I mean, Connor Bedard's so fired up. He forgot his helmet. He forgot his stick. <laughs> and you have, you know, the energy levels all the way up to 10. So some guys may be a little too aggressive on players with the puck, some without the puck, just delivering those questionable hits. So I think it'll settle in a little bit, but man, what a start. Well, with a nod to spinal tap, I'll say it was maybe up to 11, <laughs> 11. but that's, that's another, that's another, so, so let's talk about the Connor Bedard thing, because I, I was texting you and it was up on social media and you had it out on the, the scouting, the refs handle on X. He was not wearing a helmet during the warm up. I get the whole rookie solo lap thing that this is something that you want to do. And some were suggesting that it's no big deal. It is kind of a big deal because it's the legal monkeys at the NHL that make it a big deal by putting it in the rule book. And that's what the rule book is. It's a, it's a legal document. So if you come into the league after a certain point, you must wear a helmet during warmup. It does not specify you can go without the bucket during the rookie solo lap. So Again, I don't know how this happened or why it happened. Somebody probably suggested, you know what, the video will be better and this is a big deal, so don't wear the helmet. That yep. that may have been what happened here. I, I think you're right. It's good from a marketing standpoint. You want your guy out there. And, and like you said, if you join the league after 1920, you need to wear a helmet during pregame warmups. So it makes sense. You don't want guys getting injured. We've seen some near catastrophic injuries from players not wearing helmets during warmups. There's pucks flying everywhere. There's players going in different directions. Unfortunately, from an officiating standpoint, we lost Butch Mousseau a few years back who was out there before the game at, without a helmet on and, and suffered a fatal head injury because he, he fell hit the ice. And it's one of those things that you don't want to have happen at all. So I, I understand from a safety standpoint why the league put it in there, but you know, they don't really call for what the penalty is for doing this. As many have mentioned, a $2,500 fine is not a big deal. And in the Blackhawks locker room, I'm sure they had money on the board and said, right. you know what? Don't worry, rookie. We've, we've got you covered. Just go out there, have that lap and enjoy the, the flow for a little while. I, I like the the rookie lap. It's it's nice. It's a cool thing to do for players that are playing their first game. I, honestly, I don't think it really makes a big deal whether or not they have the helmet on. So maybe that's it. It's like, okay, go out, do a lap or two, 
but no pucks at least. So you don't have flying projectiles. Yeah. I think you're, you're safer without pucks. You're safer when there's not 30 guys on the ice with you, sticks, guys moving around some guys stretching. I mean, the, the goaltenders doing the leg stretches at center ice are easy to trip on. So all of that you're avoiding when you've got one, maybe two guys out there like the Blackhawks did for their rookie laps, not a big deal, but, uh, you know, to keep it out there the rest of the time, boy, if, if I'm Chicago, I want my, my top asset protected out there. I don't, right. I don't want him to be sidelined. I don't want him to miss his first NHL game because he gets hit with a puck in warmups. Okay. So let's get to the game. And in fact, just before the game starts, we had Kelly Sutherland, who is one of the best referees in the NHL, is one of the best at communicating with players. They had him do a little opening prior to the face-off. He welcomed Sidney Crosby back for another year and welcomed Connor Bedard to the National Hockey League. Some thought this was a little cringy. I like it. Kelly Sutherland seemed pretty comfortable with it. He used his what I believe were his own words and didn't read a script. I, I think this is good. I thought it was a cool thing. Uh, I think it made for great television and entertainment. And you want to tell me that on the opening face-off, and especially on opening night, the referees don't have a little chat with the players coming up to the circle. I, I think this is good to bring people inside the game. Absolutely. I, I was baffled when people were concerned about it. I know there have been some scripted moments of introductory speeches to start a season or a game or but this was off the cuff. This was natural. And these types of things happen every game. I mean, there, there's always talk at the face-off dot. So it's not like this was something that Sutherland did just for the cameras or just for the mic. I mean, he's a talkative guy. He's chatty all the time out there. So this is pretty much par for the course for him. We just got to listen in on it a little bit. And it was, it was hey, to Sid, welcome, welcome back. And it was, hey, Connor, welcome to the NHL. So nothing crazy there. And uh, I think... It was a natural conversation. This was just part of what the game is like for the guys on the ice. And, and I love that the NHL gave us a little peek at that. Absolutely. If we can get more inside the game stuff, I'm I'm good with it. So let's get into some of the game situations that we've encountered in this first week of the National Hockey League. Brian Rust opened the scoring on a nifty little puck tip past Peter Morazic in this same game, but not everybody saw the puck go in the net. Rust knew it was in. He was holding his stick up like, like he was like, hey, what guys, what, what's going on here? Play continued, but the video process came in to work and it worked properly. Yeah, that was one of those situations where he's he's the only guy or, or he and one of his teammates were the only ones who even saw the puck go in. It was in, it was out so quick, but they had an icing right afterwards. It was a chance to stop and review the play. If there hadn't been a stoppage, we would have had the, the horn sound from Toronto as they spotted the puck entering the net and they would stop play to award the goal. So a quick moment, a, a, an understandable one for the officials where depending on your positioning and, and the speed that that puck went in, hit the back bar and back out, uh, it didn't even ripple the net, no twine moving there. So it's, it's one of those moments that I'm glad we have the ability to go back after the fact and award the goal because the puck clearly crossed the line, even if it took a, a video review for us to see it. A little review showed that it was a goal, but some video reviews have also showed that there were no penalties in the early going this season. Uh, we had a high sticking call with Noel Achari. It was a double minor for cutting Tyler Johnson. However, a quick huddle and chat and review shows that Tyler Johnson actually falls on the play. Uh, I don't want to say it was a self-inflicted wound, but there was no high stick there and good work to have that penalty rescinded. Yeah, we, we joked with it. I was actually talking with Don Koharski. We called it a low sticking penalty there because <laughs> <laughs> it was it was low and you can't really penalize the guy because the stick was not above the shoulders. And when we look at the rule book there, a high stick is carried above the height of the opponent's shoulders. So in this case, the opponent was not in his normal skating stride, not in the upright position. And we see that 60.1 contains that caveat there for accidental contact on the opposing center bent over during the course of the faceoff. Now, obviously, this isn't a faceoff, but just acknowledging that when the player receiving the high stick or the stick is bent over or lower or positioned where their head is closer to the ice, it's not a high sticking penalty. So worth noting here, you know, this isn't specifically called out, but when you look at where the stick was, the position relative to the shoulders, not a high sticking call and correctly, no penalty on the play. Now, there was a, a different but similar situation in that there was no penalty called or a penalty was called, but rescinded on Timo Meyer, the New Jersey Devils in a game against Detroit. But again, that was because of a follow through on the shot. So there's no penalty that applies here. 
Right. Different aspect of the rule. Same idea, though. This is the one where it is a high stick. It's above shoulder height. But since it's a follow through, it is perfectly legal to high stick an opposing player. They they allow for that natural stick motion, whether it's wind up or follow through on a shooting motion, which could include making a pass does not include swinging wildly at the puck. You can't just wing your stick around and catch a guy up high and say, oh, I was going for the puck there. Nope. Has to be follow through on an actual shot pass type situation. And, and that's what happened with Meyer. So once again, they reviewed it. They took the opportunity and it was a good call because you see a guy that's injured on the play and you have the opportunity to review. And I think that's something that the officials seem to be doing right now is if they think it might've been a stick. And in both situations, we saw the on ice officials huddle to discuss the play. So if the referee thinks it's not a high stick, the linesman says, you know what? I saw the stick up there. They want to take a look at it. You have to call the double minor in order to review it. So I think that's the approach that we've seen. You know, when in doubt, let's let's just call it as a double minor. We can take a second look at it and get the call right. So a good move by the officials in both situations. Penalty shot was happening early in the NHL season as well. Luke Shen of the Predators grabs hold of Tampa's Brandon Hagel. Um, I, I think this was pretty easy to call as denying a scoring opportunity as Shen kind of bulldogged him to the ice. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was a no brainer there. I mean, he grabs hold, he, he rips him down and we see a penalty shot, which happened to get converted, but you look at the criteria for penalty shots and yes, it's an absolutely exciting moment, but you can't just give them out willy nilly or whatever you want. It has to be in the neutral zone or the attacking zone, which it was the infraction committed from behind, which clearly it was, you could see him reach around, grab his arm and pull him down. And the player has to be in control of the puck and then losing a scoring opportunity with nobody between that player and the goaltender. So probably one of the closer penalty shot calls we've seen as far as how close he was to the goaltender at the time. But it checked all the criteria. So it's it's the right call. Also on opening night, Vegas Golden Knights and the Seattle Kraken. The banner goes up. Cool ceremony, by the way. I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. In the third period... Golden Knight Brett Howden received a match penalty for a headshot to the Kraken's Brandon Tanev. He left the game, didn't return. He looks like he is going to miss a little bit of time. Absolutely the right call. Howden also got the call from the Department of Player Safety. He will sit for two games. Now, if I'm not mistaken, there was a headshot in the preseason with Arthur Kaliev, who got two preseason games and two regular season games. Any idea of the discrepancy here? Hard to say. I mean, this one, I was happy to see that we were looking at at two regular season games for this one. I thought it was a clear headshot. There was the opportunity to deliver a clean body check. Howden chose not to. So much like player safety always reminds us in their excellent videos of explaining the call, there was an opportunity for a clean body check. He had to take a line that would take him through the core, through the middle of Tanev's body. Instead, he picks the head. So I think two was right. Uh, I don't know if the Kaliev suspension was positioned a bit differently because it was in preseason. You know, you're still looking at the same two regular season games, two games that count. So I think they were pretty close in any case. I'm, I'm happy that two went down for this one because I think that was, that was what I was looking for and glad to see that I'm on the same page with player safety on this one. It's a good start to the season. Then if we're on the same page, uh, I'll, I'll say, I guess it was, I, I guess it was probably, uh, the right call from player safety to find Philippe Dano of the LA Kings as well. $5,000. Let's say it for the first time, the <laughs> maximum allowable under the CBA for slashing Colorado's Ross Colton. <sighs> I, you could you could call call it a, a nasty slash. Is it is it malicious? Is it intent to injure? I don't know. There was no penalty called on the play, so absolutely a fine is warranted. I I guess I would have been okay with a one game suspension too. Yeah, I would have been okay with that. I mean, it's it's not brutal. It's not particularly dangerous, but you don't really know at the time. Uh, a slash like that can be a stinger. A slash like that can uh, cause a, a serious injury to the wrist or the forearm. There, so. I think those types of things, we've talked about it in previous episodes of the podcast, it's a non-hockey play. You're not making a play on the puck. You're not doing anything to try to force a turnover or prevent a goal or anything like that. You are purely getting back at a guy who just delivered a reverse hit. A hit, by the way, Todd, that should or could have been an interference penalty because the puck was nowhere near. So you know, maybe that helps calm things down if you whistle that one. But no, this is a retaliatory move that I, I think a one game suspension would be OK by me just because it's not a hockey play. It's retaliatory in nature. And the only thing you're going to get out of it is to injure your opponent. 
There was one other hit that uh, didn't receive any further attention, but I thought might have. Brandon Carlo of the Bruins with the hit on Taylor Hall of the Hawks. Um, Hall's reaching for the puck. He gets rocked by Carlo. That one, too, looked like interference to me. Maybe there was some head contact, but it looked like most of it went through the shoulder. What was your view on this one? Uh, possible interference. That was the closest thing I was going to get. And it was funny because Chicago Blackhawks head coach Luke Richardson came out after the game and said, you know, that was a blindside hit. It was clearly a blindside hit. I know I've been delivering them my whole career, which uh, yeah. <laughs> not only is spot on, but also shows his familiarity with the rule book because the blindside portion of the rule no longer exists. You're allowed to deliver a blindside check provided it's a legal body check, provided that the head is not the main point of contact as defined under 48.1 for the illegal check to the head rule. So in this case, or in some cases, a blindside hit isn't necessarily illegal provided everything else about the hit is okay. And and in this case, it was. Like I said, I thought it could have been an interference call, maybe looking at a minor there. It's one of those situations where the legality of the hit isn't as bad as the possible outcome because the the player being hit wasn't aware that it was coming and no chance to brace for impact. And those are the types that sometimes result in a, a, a worse injury. But from a, a hit standpoint, it, it was an ugly one. It's probably one we, we don't love to see when it comes to player safety. But by the book, I, I think at most you're looking at an interference minor. There's one other story from this past week I want to ask you about. You had a nice piece up on the Scouting the Refs uh, website, scoutingtherefs.com. has to do with former NHL referee Tim Peel and his recent comments about how he officiated games. On a podcast with Jeremy Roenick, Jeremy Roenick has a podcast? Boy, with Tim one, Peel, apparently. <laughs> they'll give one of those to anyone, won't they? It's, it, I'm paraphrasing here, but Tim Peel said... Yes, he gave preferential treatment to star players like Sidney Crosby. He wasn't going to ignore match penalties or something severe like that, but he cut them some slack on marginal calls, whereas, as he called them, fourth-line pluggers would get rung up just about every time. It's because the fans come to see the stars and not the fourth-line guys. And I know that some are trying to maybe manufacture a bit of a controversy about this, but... Is, is anyone really surprised at this, that stars get treated differently? Happens every day in all walks of life. I think that was the the overwhelming response that I was seeing out there was folks going, well, yeah, and water is wet and everything <laughs> else that we already know. Because uh, for many, this this was not really a, a big revelation, not really a shock there that, that star players get treated differently. I think having a, a former NHL referee come out and say it or admit that they have a different penalty standard for superstar players than fourth line pluggers was a, a bit surprising. I mean, you hope when we look at the rule book that it's called consistently, right? That's what everybody wants from game one of the season to game seven of the Stanley cup final. You want the rules applied consistently game in game out, regardless of whether it's the first period or overtime. And it absolutely applies from a player standpoint too. Now, if, if you've got a hooking penalty that causes a turnover and a change of possession, or maybe creates or prevents a scoring chance, it shouldn't matter who caused that turnover. It shouldn't matter who hooked the opposing player. If uh, if Crosby takes a guy down, it's it's the same thing as a fourth liner taking a guy down. The, the outcome is the same regardless of superstar status. So yeah, the 18,000 fans are, are there to see the superstars, but we also need the superstars to play within the rules. And the 18,000 fans, quite honestly, in the building are, are there to see their team win. So if Sidney Crosby's getting a break as a visiting player, I don't think Tim's making those 18,000 fans happy. Well, some would argue that Tim Peel never made the 18,000 fans are happy every night, wouldn't you say? Well, you know what? Some, I, I guess it depends on <laughs> who's playing, who's in the building. And if your team has superstars at home, you might have a good night. Okay. What do you say we get to our guest? Because he's had a terrific career. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, plenty of years in the OHL, plenty of years in the AHL, over 20 plus in both, uh, over a thousand games in both. He's he's won the Ken Bowden Distal Award. He's won the Mike Condon Award. So he has quite an impressive resume as a linesman. He worked more than 20 years in the OHL. He's officially now retired from the on-ice work. He's going to stay involved with the league as an officiating manager he worked over a thousand games, worked four Memorial Cups, 12 OHL championship finals, two OHL all-star games, 200 playoff games, an NHL top prospects games. Wow, that's a lot of work, Kevin Hastings. Are you ready to catch your breath for a few minutes now? Yeah, I'm, it's uh, it's been a whirlwind, but yeah, I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I think I finally caught my breath and I'm on a little break, so I'm good to go. Yep, <laughs> ready to roll. 
It's nice, but it, it's it's nice that you're smiling and happy and, and talking about uh, the game that you love and spent so much time in the Ontario Hockey League. Yeah, you know, I was, I was you know, so fortunate. You know, I'm a little biased uh, by saying that, you know, fortunate enough to work the greatest junior league in the world in my mind and uh, to have 23 years in it and uh, just, you know, the friendships and everybody I've had and coaches and it, it's been memorable for me. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, of the twelve hundred games, anything that really sticks out? Any moments that uh, that really stay with you? Um, you know, uh, I've been asked that question quite a bit in the last week or so. You know what? There's there's so many. There's so many games. Uh, you mean the rivalries of different teams in different towns and uh, the players? But I, I always go back and like my greatest memories. Yeah, I've worked a lot of big games and you know Memorial Cup finals and Game Sevens and yada yada yada. But a lot of my memories are the friendships and the bonds that I made with my fellow officials. And some of my greatest friends in the world are my fellow officials that I've worked with. And what I've taken out of it, um, yeah, is having that, you know, friendships and, yeah, the games are all good. And, you know, being able to work, you know, tournaments and this and that. But I think the greatest thing is friendships and camaraderie of all the people I've met and being able to be friendships with. That's the best answer I think you could give. So after all the the regular season games, playoffs, game sevens, and memorable moments as you talked about, how did you finally reach the decision and say, okay, this is it, I'm getting off the ice? Well, you know, it's a good question. I, uh, I planned, I'm 51 years old now, so I planned on this year being my final year. I was gonna wrap it up at the end of the year in the OHL. Uh, last February, I wrapped it up in the American Hockey League after I worked the All-Star game. I did my final game in Toronto. Um, last year, I had to stop because I had to go have uh, knee surgery for the third time on my same leg. And we've come to a point now where I need a whole knee replacement. So it, it, it's not fair to the game. It's not fair to my fellow officials to be out there struggling and I can't move out there. And it, it, it was just time. I, I knew... Um, if you can't give 110%, then you know what, it's over and it's time to move on and do other things. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's just, it takes a toll on your body as an official and as a player, which I know you played before that, what made you first decide to make the jump to officiating and and what thoughts do you have for guys who maybe are, are playing the game now about you know, whether or not they should consider putting on the stripes? Well, when I retired from playing in the Central Hockey League uh, back in the day, uh, I wanted to stay in the game of hockey. And when I came home, uh, a gentleman by the name of Al Da, who was running the Ontario Hockey Association at the time, said, hey, Kevin, do you want to be a linesman? And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to stay in the game. And he says, okay, you got a junior A game in two days. A guy's got quick gear for you. So I met him. I met Terry Hobart. He had some equipment for me. We went and did the game, and uh, the rest, I would say, is is history. Um, but, hey, man, for all ex-players or for anybody, to stay in the game and have the right attitude about it, like you're in a team atmosphere. You're on the ice with the best players in the world. You know, it's it's unbelievable. That That's what I really want, like the, the camaraderie with the guys and going out and working your best and having a final outcome at the end of the game. That, that, that was the most gratifying part and that I still get chills thinking about, you know, I miss being on the ice, but that that's what it's all about. It's about working the best that you can work and with your team. And at the end of the night, that's it. You mentioned being on the ice with the best players, worked in the OHL, worked some American Hockey League. Did you ever think about maybe making it all the way to the big show in the NHL one day? Well, you know, I'm, I, I, I would say with my career early on, I was pretty fast-tracked. Uh, like um, the third year of ever officiating, I'm working the Memorial Cup Finals. The next year, I've worked games one, two, six, and seven in the Calder Cup Finals. You know, it it didn't work out, and so be it. Um, I, I had the mindset that, you know what? If I go to the NHL, I go to the NHL. If not, I'm not going to pout. I'm going to put my nose to the grindstone. I'm going to work hard and try and conquer every league and every game a day at a time. And uh, that's the way I, I've i always thought about it up until last Saturday when I skated off the ice for the last time. 
Yeah. And you've, you really carved out quite a career there. I mean, just look for me posting the officials assignments and just seeing Hastings come up again and again and again, and I'm, I'm you're in the OHL, you're in the AHL. I saw your name enough times over the years and uh, definitely an impressive career. You know, you've got the Michael Condon award, you picked up a Bodie along the way. What's next. So what I know you're staying as part of the game. I know you're going upstairs, but what's, uh, what's next for Kevin Hastings in the OHL? Well, in the OHL, um, I'm uh, joining as an officiating manager with the league. I've already started. Uh, I'm just, uh, when I'm done work tonight, I'll head off to London and uh, and watch the game tonight. And just working a lot with the young people, working with the uh, guys, the, the men and the women that we have on our staff. Um, just everything that I was taught back in the day from the likes of, you know, Ken Cox and Jim Carmen. And throughout my career, what I've picked up, if I can translate and help them out to get their game better, um, that, that's my job. So, you know, meaning going watching younger younger officials in other leagues to maybe one day, hopefully, that they can progress on to the Ontario Hockey League. Uh, go watch them and scout them. And, uh, yeah, just to stay in the game. And uh, I'll be helping out with the American Hockey League as well this year, too. So, it's... Uh, yeah, it's, it, it, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I enjoy the interaction of being able to teach people and, and get their feedback and, and how they felt on the game and how maybe we can change it and what's good, what's bad. But it's, uh, yeah, it, so far it's been, uh, it, things haven't changed that much. I see, I feel like I, I get home from work and it's into a suit, you know, shower, clean up and back to the ring. So uh, my routines have not changed too much. Kevin Hastings, he is off the ice, but still part of the officiating fraternity now in a manager capacity. Don't forget to go up tonight and not down to the dressing room to go out <laughs> onto the ice when you go. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Take care. Good stuff, man. Way to work. Get in the box. Easy. It's the Scouting the Refs podcast. Nice Read more at scoutingtherefs.com. Follow Scouting the Refs on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Email the show at ref at scoutingtherefs.com. Very good, my book. Subscribe, share, and keep those sticks down. That's good play.